the Greater St. John Cathedral is located in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. It is a vibrant ministry that is designed to meet the spiritual needs of the entire family. We have classes, prayer calls, and fellowship opportunities for men, women, children, youth, and seniors. And we have room for you. Welcome to the broadcast. Good evening, Greater Family. Um, thanks for joining us on tonight for our last installment in our series on women in the Exodus. Now, let me ask a logistical question before we get started. Um, Deacon Simmons, Minister Angela, was that video freezing for you guys just now? Yes, it was. Okay. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure it wasn't me and to give you guys a warning that if the internet goes out or something happens, y'all got it for the rest of the night. So just, <laughs> just FYI. All right, let me see if I can close out of something else too and maybe save some bandwidth. Okay, so tonight again, we'll close out our um, final installment in our series on women in the Exodus. This has been fun. Um, I'm so grateful that, number one, that we have a church that's willing to read the Bible in new and fresh ways that we have people who are willing to go in the direction um, and that nobody's trying to dictate how we believe or how we read or how we study, but that we're all open to bringing our questions and our perspectives to the text so that the Holy Spirit might breathe new life for us. I think at the end of the day, it's important to remember that we believe that the Holy Spirit gives interpretation, right? And that the Spirit leads and guides us and helps us to understand the text um, as we encounter them. And so we trust the Spirit to do her good work as we um, engage the texts, uh, not just tonight and in the, the past few nights, but as we go forward. You know, you never want the Bible to become stale for you. It's a living, breathing scripture. And so um I heard you. I just want to make sure I, you know I heard you. I, I know you heard me because that's why you saw when I said it. Um but I, but I but I want us to I'm I'm grateful that God still lives and moves through the scripture, right? That the scripture is as alive as the God we serve. So and yes, I know you heard me. Um so Minister Angela Deacon Simmons, do you want to greet the people on this evening? I'm I'm trying to buy us a little bit of time because Bishop said we always just jump right in. We don't even give people time to log in. So uh do you good want evening, to everybody. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. What's up? Thank you all. Okay, so we're go ahead, we'll go ahead and get started. And also to let you all know tonight, these are the passages we're using, and we don't have a lot of slides. We don't have a lot of pre-planned discussion questions. Um, we are hoping that tonight's conversation will um, evolve organically based on what's in the text. So we're just going to go with it um, as soon as I can figure out where my controls are. All right. So, Minister Angela, do you want to read um, our first two verses for tonight? Okay. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand <clears throat> and all the women went out after her with the timbrels and with dances and Miriam answered them sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea thank you minister Angela so tonight we're going to focus our study on Miriam we talked a little bit about Miriam earlier when uh, Miriam, the sister, watched as her baby brother was placed into the Nile River and adopted by the princess, uh, the daughter of Pharaoh, and then nursed by her mother. So Miriam demonstrated her leadership acumen and her courage when she negotiated with the princess to have her mother serve as the wet nurse for her baby brother um, so that he could be nursed and then weaned before he was returned to the palace. So that covered him, that protected him and saved him from the genocide that was taking place of the baby boys in uh, among the Hebrew nation. So now we're returning to Miriam as she reappears in the text and now she's older um, and 
she's older and the the people of israel are now transitioning out of the red sea so they've crossed the sea the red sea slash reed sea there's some discrepancies about what the name of the sea is but whatever the case they don't came up out the water they've been delivered and now they're on the other side and they're celebrating so here in exodus chapter 15 this passage of scripture uh in your bibles the heading probably says the song of Miriam and the passage, the preceding pericope right before this one says the song of Moses. But in reality, uh, when we look at the history of how the Bible is redacted and when passages are written, this particular passage right here is one of the oldest passages in the Old Testament. And the song of Miriam actually predates. So it's older than the song of Moses. And in truth, this little section in quotation marks in verse 21 that Miriam answered them is from a song called the Song of the Sea. So this is an old passage of scripture that circulated throughout the, uh, I'm sorry, an old psalm almost that circulated throughout the Afro-Asiatic world. And here it's being quoted again. So it appears first in the mouth of Miriam. And then when Moses sings it, so it's added into the mouth of Moses and expand it. So other uh, aspects of the story of the people of Israel and the Lord's deliverance of these Hebrew folks was added into the song of the sea. But this is the original song. It's as if we have a song and y'all know how in our community, sometimes we add extra verses to the songs. Like we remix them. Like we might have a hymn and the hymn has like two stanzas and then we like blackenize it or we, we <laughs> contextualize it, localize it and add extra verses. So that's what happened here. So Miriam is singing the song. And then when it's uh, when the editors get to the text, they're like, nah, but Moses is the real leader. So let's put it in the mouth of Moses and let's expand it. Um, there is some. Bible scholars have some thoughts about when that expansion took place. And a lot of it was, um, is suspected to have taken place during the exile. So when the people of Israel were exiled in Babylon and really needed to concretize who they understood their God to be because they were in chaos, right? And they were separated. And so they needed something to tether them to what they believed. And so they believed that these kinds of expansions happened in the Exodus narrative and some of the other first five, the first five books of the Pentateuch and then this one in particular. So here we are with Miriam leading the people in song. And the most important thing that I wanted to point out here is that the text calls Miriam a prophet. Now Deacon Simmons and I had some conversation about this prophet versus prophetess piece. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to go forward to that slide and then I'm going to come back to this slide. So there are some discrepancies in our Greek and our Hebrew language for our Bible texts about how men's roles are described versus how, how women's roles are described, described. And the example that I used for Deacon Simmons was the difference between a man deacon and a woman deacon as they appeared in the New Testament. So a lot of times we hear deaconess or we even use deaconess in our church and there's a particular role that's played by deaconess. But in Romans 16, 1, um, the, the text is told about Phoebe, but Phoebe was not a deaconess. Phoebe was a deacon who happened to be a woman. So there were deacons who were women and deacons who were men. And they serve the same roles, waiting the table, serving the leaders, making sure the... Um, the apostles had what they needed, making sure the disciples were cared for, et cetera. So they served in that same capacity. They served the tables. They were um, stewards over the finances. There were also deaconesses. And those deaconesses, which appeared in the early church, so in the first centuries um, after the establishment of the church, deaconesses had a specific role. And their role was to care for the widows they were wives of the deacons and their job was really to take care of the women. But those deaconesses were distinct from women deacons. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because in the same way, there's no such thing as a prophetess. So in Hebrew scriptures, there's no distinction between the prophets who are men and the prophets who are women. We in our English translations and in our modern interpretations have created this a separate role called prophetess, but there's really no distinction in those roles. Um, Deacon Simmons, was there anything else we mentioned about this before I go back to the verses? No, that was it. Okay. 
Um, any questions or additional comments you guys would like to add about the fact that Miriam is called a prophet here? No, I'm good. I'm good with it. There's some other things I saw in the text I wanted to ask you a question about, though. Yep, I see Sister Jennifer has a question, but I heard when visiting other churches that women were being called deacons. Please explain. Yeah, exactly. So um, churches, I, let me say this, uh, and I hope it's not a surprise to anyone. Much of what we do in our church practices was human practice or human rules and regulations that were established as the church grew and developed. We are not doing things the way they were done in the scripture. Uh, it might be a surprise to some folks. We're just not. With that said, churches who are a part of certain types of denominations have certain ways of delegating their roles. Some churches that are non-denominational or are independent, not really under an umbrella or governing body, determine within their congregation how their roles are going to be um, identified. A good example is elder. In some churches, an elder is a senior pastor. In other churches, an elder is a servant. In other churches, an elder is a person who is of a certain age. And so they're respected as an elder of the community, but that term is used all kinds of different ways. So there are some denominations, for instance, in the in Catholicism, a deacon is um, an official role, but is more than just waiting tables, right? So a deacon also ministers, um, a deacon also serves the people. That's not that different than the way we understand deacons. Although in our case, our deacons are most often seen um, serving as stewards or waiting the people directly. But in reality, our deacons are ordained just like our ministers are. So our deacons can preach, our deacons can teach, our deacons can serve in that way. So to your point, um, Sister Jennifer, there are some denominations or some churches where deacons operate in that same capacity. They preach, they teach, they wait tables. It really depends on the denomination or the congregation that um, the person is in. Um, so thanks for that question. All right, I'm going back to the previous verse so we can look at Miriam and her role again. So Miriam here is called a prophet. She's called the sister of Aaron. And the text says that she took the timbrel in her hand. Here's the second thing I wanted to talk about. A timbrel, what, what have you guys heard of, uh, understood a timbrel to be? Uh, some people think it's a tambourine, but really that's not what they're talking about here. Yeah. So what is it, Deacon Simmons? What's a timbrel if it's not a tambourine? Just what they're talking about here is a hand drum. It's a hand drum. So um, when we talk about the Bible as an Afro-Asiatic document, what comes to mind when you think of a woman with a hand drum leading the people in celebration uh, because of God's act? Um. Yeah. You know, the drum plays a significant role, as you say, in the African American community in the African American community. I mean, that leads I mean, everything is done by the drum, right? It, and her her here, I mean her when I say her, meaning Miriam, um she's she's lead she's in the role of, of leading you know, she's leading the she's actually leading the church. I mean, this this worship here with these women. And and not only that. Her, I mean, from, if if you if you're saying that her song was predates Moses' song, and they just, you know, arbitrarily put put these words in Moses' mouth, then what 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 we are saying here is a woman was the first. Well, I shouldn't say it was the first, but you see this woman, yep, um, you know, acclaiming God's power. To the people. Yep. Yeah, she's she's is it leading considered the a worship leader. Yes. This is the first example of a person doing this kind of corporate worship leading. And here it is that it's a woman and she's also called a prophet. The other thing this does is help us to see the activity of prophecy a little differently. So this should expand our understanding of what a prophet is and what a prophet does. She's called a prophet and she also takes up the drum and leads the people in song. You know, the other thing this reminded me of is um, 
Bishop Colson, when I first got licensed to preach, and I don't know how many of y'all remember Bishop Colson, but one of the things Bishop Colson always encouraged ministers to do was make sure you have a sermon and a song. So if at any point you're asked to lead the people in devotion, you can do so. I, I think that we focus a lot on preaching and we focus a lot on teaching, but we forget these other aspects of leading the people in corporate worship. Because worship, singing, song, dancing, all of that is a part of who we are as the body of Christ. And all of that is significant in our leadership roles and our calls. Yeah, I, I was stunned by the fact that it only mentions that she was the sister of Aaron. Yeah. Um, so the way Miriam is described in several of these passages is interesting. In some, in this place, she's called the sister of Aaron, but there's no mention of her being the brother of Moses. In another passage, she's so in the earlier passage in uh, chapter one that we were looking at, she's not named at all, right? Um, where it's just, the text just says his sister. So um, it's interesting because uh, before we logged on, Deacon Simmons and I were talking about how. Our stories in our Bible, in the Old Testament, and especially in the Pentateuch or in the first five books of the Bible, we, we share this sort of, um, I call it like a textual ancestry as um, Abrahamic faith tradition. So traditions, uh, uh, religious traditions that descended from Abraham are Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And so we have some of our scripture in common, but often as Christians, we don't ever look to see how these characters or these stories evolve in, in Judaism, which shares a lot of our commonalities in our Christian Bible, but especially in the Islamic tradition. And in later, like rabbinic Judaism, so in later texts with the rabbis, Miriam has, a, there's a lot that's written about her. So there's a lot of tradition about Miriam, a lot of stories about Miriam, a lot of what the rabbis call midrash about Miriam, which is like commentary on Miriam's story and the way Miriam appears. Miriam comes up a couple of different places in the Old Testament and even makes an appearance like a story about Miriam uh, or a reference to Miriam appears in the New Testament as well. But um, there's much more written about Miriam if we look at later commentaries and other types of readings and other types of scripture. Um, yeah, so, yeah one, go ahead. One, no, just one other thing I, I was wanted to bring up and that is now during the Passover, they had to leave in a hurry, right? Yeah. But she brings the drum with her. Or the women bring the drum with them. They didn't leave. I mean, if I'm looking around to find out what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring with me, if they're telling me that, hey, look, you got to get out of here. You got to get pack up. You got to be ready to roll. <laughs> she, yeah, brings, she, brings, she brings the drum with her. Yeah. As if to say she's not with them. If you remember, they brought a lot of stuff with them. In addition to the stuff they had, they went and borrowed stuff from their neighbors because they knew they had to make an exit, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, she brought the drum because the drum had value. Um, and if we think about, so this is where I would encourage us, I think I mentioned before that part of what, um, part of what I study and part of what I'm trying to research is the ways that African experiences appear in the Exodus text. So the drum was of value in front of the people for African descended people, right? All right. The drum was the way that they celebrated. The drum was the way that they spoke to God. The drum was the way that God spoke to them. So of course, Miriam is leaving out of Egypt, right? So leaving out of this African, Afro-Asiatic space with this drum in her hand because this drum held value. Yeah. It might, it, and my and point is it a was, part of their culture as well? It's Absolutely. a part of their culture. Yeah. So then that does that change well, that's how you one of the things. Yeah, that's one of the things you would not that's like today. A lot of people say, you know, you want to take what would you take, you know, with you if you had to leave your home really quickly? Yes. A lot of people would take pictures because they say those pictures are irreplaceable, you know, right. things like that. So they're things of value to you. Yeah. Well, my, my point, my point Go ahead. Yeah, my, my point was that she was and uh, she had to be anticipating where she was going was going to be a place of praise, right? Mm. So she didn't leave her praise behind in Egypt. She brought it with her, right? That yeah. was my point. Yeah. 
after so all that. Makes me wonder, what are we, how are we preparing for what we're praying for? So if you're praying for deliverance, how are you preparing for the deliverance you're praying for? If you're praying for healing, how are you preparing for the healing you're praying for? If you're praying for a new job, how are you preparing for the new job you're praying for? Are you waking up late? Are you showing up to work late? Are you raggedy when you show up to work? Are you getting your work done? You're praying for advancement, but you're not preparing for the advancement that you're praying for. Yeah, so you're right, Deacon Simmons. She brought her praise with her. And not just that, I think that it, it represented more than her praise. It also represented her leadership. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yes, Sister Tanya, stay in a perpetual state of expectancy. Okay, so Miriam, we know here is a prophet. We know that she has this hand drum with her. She know that the women followed her. The people followed her. So the other thing this said to me is a good leader has followers. Yes. Right? Yeah. I remember Bishop used to say, um, you can't, you know, if, you, if you're a leader and you don't have followers, you're just a person taking a walk. <laughs> yeah. But a good leader has followers. And so I wonder, what does it take to get the people to follow you and not just follow you, but but, Bish, uh, but Deacon Simmons, follow you in your praise? What does it take for people to follow you? If you're a worship leader and you're a praise leader, what is, what's necessary for you to follow, for ha for you for people to follow you? Yeah, that's a good um, question. I mean, you have to be a really authentic. Authenticity. Yeah, authentic in your praise, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, just lead by example. She takes the, she lead, lead, she led, she led. Yeah. It says she took the timber in her hand. Yep. She was out front. Yes. She was out front singing and dancing. Listen, she was a, she was a, a one man, a one woman praise team, right? Praise team what? and dancer. Yeah, you know, that's funny. The thing I was thinking about when people are leading me in worship, and I know everybody has their own preferences, but one of my pet peeves is, don't yell at me when you're leading lift worship. Lift your hand. Lift your hand. Just worship. I'm going to come with you. You go, and I'm going to come right, with right. you. You ain't got to yell at me. Just go. <laughs> just just go in worship, and I'm right there. Just go in praise, and I'm coming behind you. Right? Right. right. Yeah. Um, Deacon Max says the drum was also used to communicate over distance because it carries farther than your voice. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the, here's the next piece I wanted to, I wanted to talk about. So she's leading, the people are following her and what she says is sing, so the, the, she says, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider. He is thrown into the seat. And what caught me when I looked at this passage and when I translated it is that the text says Miriam answered. It doesn't say Miriam said. And I was trying to figure out what was she answering? You so I did a little digging and I was reading some commentaries and just kind of reflecting on the passage. And what one commentator says is that Miriam led the people in a call and response. Right. So you know how we do our back and forth in text as if yes. it's like uh, in script in, in church, like responsive reading or praise and worship where the worship leader says one thing and then the people respond and then the worship leader says something else. So this was that type of exchange. Miriam led the people out with the timbrel and the dancing, the people sang, and then she went back and forth with them. And then at this point, she answers them, sing to the Lord. So she rule Yahweh, ki ga o ga a, suswaro kavo rama vayam, because the horse and its rider had been thrown into the sea. Yes, Sister Wendy says, don't treat me like I'm at a concert when we're in praise and worship. So she's <laughs> in an, an exchange with them. It's a partnership. This also tells us what corporate praise and worship ought to look like. It's not a performance. It's a partnership where everybody comes together. Everybody brings a piece. One person is leading, somebody's dancing, somebody's playing the music, and the rest of us are engaged in song so that together we are celebrating what God has done. All right, I'm moving on because I know we're getting um, semi-short on time. We talked a little bit about this, the gender, the gender roles. The next thing I wanted to talk about is Miriam is called a prophet in the previous verse, but I also wanted to list for us the other women prophets in the Old Testament. So Miriam is one. Deborah is another one. The other person that's called a prophet is Isaiah's baby mama. And I was going to write it like that, Isaiah's baby mama. 
But there is a passage in Isaiah where Isaiah um, is told by the Lord to have these children with this unnamed prophet woman and give prophetic names to the children as a way of uh, his message. So he's ministering through the names of his children. Um, but this baby mama is another prophet. She's just not named. Then there's Noadiah. There's also Huldah. There's a passage in Ezekiel chapter 13 where Ezekiel is condemning the, these women prophets that are performing these rituals and their birth rituals. So I call them the ritualists in Ezekiel 13. And then there are two passages in Genesis with midwives that I also call these prophets. The scripture doesn't call them prophets, <coughs> but wherever the other prophets, especially the men prophets appear, there's this prophetic oracle that takes place. And when I say it, you're going to remember having read it. Thus says the Lord, right? So whenever the prophets are getting ready to proclaim to the people, they say, thus says the Lord. In Hebrew, they say, ko amar Hashem, thus says the Lord. And there are two passages in Genesis where the midwives say to the women who are giving birth, thus says the Lord. You ain't got to worry. You're going to give birth to this child and this child is going to live. This child is going to thrive. This child is going to be successful. Because they're using that same prophetic oracle I am designating these women as prophets. They're functioning the same way as the rest of the prophets. Um, how, uh, so I, I want to ask our panelists, how many of these other women prophets were you aware of and whose stories had you read before? Um, I mean, the only me. one I know oh, of sorry. is Miriam, Deborah. I never thought about the midwife thing until you just said that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Holda, I've heard the name, but I did, I've never really read a lot about her. Yeah, if, if we had a longer study tonight or maybe more time, I will probably try to go into a little bit more about their stories. But I really just wanted to put their names on our, our radar so that when folks are reading in their own time, they can go read about these other women prophets. Deacon Simmons, what were you going to say? No, same thing uh, Miss Angela said. Yeah. Yeah, Miriam, Deborah, and Holda. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting when you look at the way these other women prophets appear um, and the type of leadership they have. One of the things Deacon Simmons and I were talking about before we logged on, uh, we went live tonight was just how many women's stories there really are in the Bible that we read over. or We just haven't paid attention to. But when you stop and really read their stories in depth, it, it opens up um, new vistas in the scripture. It does. It does. And it really, it really does. I mean, just this four week study has done so much for me as, uh, you know, we had to read better. We had to read, I mean, we had to read, you know what I mean? And read the whole story. Right. Yeah. And not just gloss over it. Yeah, I know so we, I know we, I know we're in a patriotic, you know, uh, um, you know, um, patriarchal. Yeah. Patriarchal society and all that stuff when it comes to the Bible. And I mean, read it from that lens. Uh, but I think we need to stop and read the story of these women, yeah, and the significant role that they played in the redemptive story. You know, I agree. So this is the so we're gonna the in this next passage about Miriam is where we're gonna spend the rest of our time tonight. And I think it was important for us to kind of lay the groundwork so we'll see um, Miriam's complete picture from the Exodus. So we started with her being an advocate for her brother and um, a guardian for her brother. Now we see her as this worship leader in front of the people um, in, and also operating as a prophet. So now let's go to the next passage. Minister Angela, do you want to read Numbers chapter 12, verses 9 through 12 for us? Okay. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, Oh my God, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed uh, when he comes out of his mother's womb. All right, I'm going to go on to the next three verses just so we can get a complete picture of this passage. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had put spit uh, in her face, 
will she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. Okay, I'm going to take the slides down so we can um, continue with our discussion. So in Numbers chapter 12, the people have made this pit stop at this temporary encampment called Hazarot. And while they're there, the text says that Miriam and Aaron got jealous, basically, that Moses was getting all the shine, that Moses was the one being recognized as the spokesperson for God, even though the three of them had been designated as this like leadership triad. So they were all serving as divine spokespersons and they've been in their frustrations. So the narrator, in the way the text is framed, wants us to believe that Miriam and Aaron's displeasure was because Moses married this Nubian woman or this black woman. Um, but there's nothing else in the text to support that that argument. So um, I, I, I'm going to dis disregard that for a second. The text continues that the Lord hears Miriam and Aaron's conversation and basically is angry. So, so God calls a meeting. God calls a, a family meeting up on the mount, and Moses and Aaron, and Moses, Aaron, and Miriam are summoned for this family meeting. And there, God affirms Moses as the chosen one. And at the end of the exchange, the glory cloud lifts, and Miriam has been inflicted with a skin disease. Miriam is leprous. Now, when we were talking about this, um, Minister Angela made a comment about this, and Deacon Simmons also made a comment about this. Do you want to share what your questions and or observations were about Miriam being leprous when the glory cloud lifts? Well, I guess my thought was, um, did God make her a leper because she called herself talking against Moses saying, okay, is God the only, is God only speaking to him and not us? That's in the passage that comes before that. So that's why all of this is transpiring. So when God heard her and Aaron talking about it, you know, it's assumed in the text as you read it, that that's what happened, but it's not what, like, as you pointed out, that's not what it says. So we can't really assume and we can't isogeet and put our own thoughts in there. So we want to be clear. So that was my part of it. Yeah, it was yeah. just going back to your point, Minister Angela, it was just assumed that, you know, that that God had had uh, made her leprous because, you know, when the cloud lifts, mm -hmm. I don't even realize, I don't, it doesn't even say that Miriam even recognized that she is leprous. It says that Aaron looks at her and sees that she's leprous. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read my notes about this, and then I'm gonna go back um, and re and respond to these questions about whether or not I believe God made Miriam leprous. So when you read this in the New King James, you'll notice in verse ten that Miriam is white as snow, but the Hebrew in this verse does not include the word white. It says that Miriam became leprous like snow. So one commentator, Dr. Will Gaffney, argues that because leprosy causes the skin to flake, the text likened the flaking to snow and later translators added the word white. I argue that this is a literary move related to the narrator's reference to Moses' wife's blackness. In my estimation, this is the translator's way of broadening the, the divide between Miriam and her sister-in-law. Either way, there is outward evidence that there is something different about Miriam, that she has changed and she's in need of restoration. That same commentator argues that Aaron was also afflicted based on his proclamation in verse 13. Here is my argument that Moses, Aaron, and Miriam are all on the mount encountering God face to face and the glory cloud descends. The glory cloud is almost this protective covering to shield them from being face to face with God. But God's presence, God's full presence is encountering the three of them as they're in this meeting. Now, Moses has the covering of the anointing of being the prophet. Aaron has the covering of the anointing of being the priest. I contend that Aaron's anointing as priest served as a protective covering. And because Moses had previously been anointed 
for entering the Holy One's presence, Miriam was the only one who encountered the Holy Presence without a spiritual safety suit. And the result was a change in her appearance. So I'm arguing that it wasn't that God made Miriam leprous. I'm arguing that God was angry with both of them. But when Miriam encountered the Lord's presence, she didn't have anything to cover her. And so the result was that there was a change in her body and she became leprous. Now, the text doesn't resolve what appears to be this unequal doling out of punishment but what we're left with is Miriam in need of healing. But part of what that does for me is resolve the question why Miriam was punished and Aaron was not. Because the text tells us that both of them were complaining. Both of them were murmuring, but Aaron almost walked away unscathed. And so for Miriam to be punished by God and Aaron not to be punished by God, it sets up this um, inequity in how God deals with this behavior. Yeah, it was it was harsh. It was yeah. it was really it was really harsh. I I felt it was harsh. Yeah, um, but if you if you understood it, not that God caused Miriam to be leprous, but that Miriam's lack of of spiritual covering, covering. when she entered into the presence of God, how does that change the way you look at this passage? Well, that's true too. If if you're su- yeah. if you're suggesting that 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 God wasn't the cause of her her leprosy. Um, yes, because even like they said, even any of the priests or anybody that goes before God has to be anointed first. They have to be cleansed. All of that. People took time to do that kind of stuff, even before going into the Holy of Holies. They took the time to anoint themselves and prepare themselves to go before God. They didn't just roll up in, you know, in his presence any old kind of way. But at the same time, I mean, I think. Um, this was not Moses' first time dealing with this leprosy thing. I mean, early on in the process, you know, he the God tells him, places his hand within his bosom, he pulls it out, and then his hand is leprous, right? Right. Does the text say that God made his hand leprous? Right, right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I think the, the thing that's, um, the, the other thing I was thinking is, Miriam, on some level, you know, Minister Angela asked earlier, you know, what right did Aaron and Miriam have to question God and God's use of Moses? And and Deacon Simmons, you made a comment about that. Do you want to share? Uh, I did. I did. Know? I did. I did. I did say that I believe that leaders. I mean, I did. I believe that leaders should be open to questioning. Yeah. Um, I mean, kick, kick me out if you want to put me out, but I'm just saying, I just you know, believe. Leadership should. But when you're talking about God, she, they he, they were basically questioning why God is speaking to them, you know, is speaking to Moses and as if he doesn't speak to them. So, well, well I mean, if you're going to question God about what he's going to do, then, you know. Maybe he does get slightly, you know, okay, this is my choice. <laughs> but I think God is big enough more. to handle, I think God is big enough to handle our questions as well, though. Well, I think so too, but he's made a decision. Uh, but I get, I mean, I, I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, I understand. Hey, look. I mean, I, well, you know, you can try it and let me know how it worked out for you. I no, mean, no, I, no. I here, here's, my, here's my thing, right? I just, <laughs> okay. I, if we're believing that God was the one that caused her to be leprous, I mean, Miriam has played a significant role in the redemptive process. Right. I agree. Moses has been on the backside of a mountain with some sheep to Texas for over 40 years. Yeah. Miriam was in Egypt leading the women um, doing some real harsh and bitter times. I agree. And trust me, I am, you, you talking preaching to the choir because I am really all for women who do the job, who get it done. I mean, who study, who, who stand before the people and who, who are out front. I get that. But at the same time, God made a decision. He didn't choose Miriam to be the main person. No, I get that. He chose Moses. 
That's true. It. And Deacon, Deacon Max says here in the comments, I think the difference is asking versus questioning, which implies doubt. But you know what? The biblical witness um, gives us evidence to the fact that God is big enough to handle the questions. He God is. doesn't always have to respond the way we want God to. God doesn't always have to answer the way we want God to. And sometimes God doesn't answer at all. But God is still big enough to handle the questions. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think I want to come back to I want to come back to Deacon Simmons' point about leadership being open to questions. Leadership should always be open to questions. But I then back to Minister Angela's point, though, the people who are following need to be prepared that they won't get to, to receive a response that's not the response that they're looking for. That doesn't mean we should stop raising the questions. Now, and at the same time, now, look, help me. I just want to make sure we understand this, right? And so I understand leadership, right? Yeah. I've been trained in leadership, right? And so I understand that there are times when a leader is going to give an instruction yeah. without any uh, reasoning. Right. And the response is for the individual hearing what the leader has said. Is to follow what the leader said. Yeah, I I, don't, I totally get that. Yes, because I don't always have a have time to explain to you why, right? Yeah. I just need you to do this right now. I know why. I need you to trust that I know why. Yeah. And, and well, sometimes and, the question isn't a lack of trust. Sometimes the question is for understanding, for clarity. Sometimes asking the question and understanding the rationale helps to grow the follower. Um, especially if the follower is a future leader or a co-leader. So right. having some rationale behind the decision-making um, sometimes gives rise to the questions. Another commentator says that part of their concern or suggests that part of Miriam's concern was not just the fact that Moses was the chosen leader, but that Moses was the chosen leader that sometimes had some raggedy decision-making. Yeah. Right. So the fact that it the, the text says that they were or the narrator says that they were arguing about Moses Nubian wife, remembering that he had another wife that he was married to that he took back to her father. So right. some commentators are suggesting that Miriam, Miriam and Aaron were saying this dude is not stable. What about that other family he dumped off? Is he going to dump the people of Israel off in the wilderness because he's tired of us as well? Right. So it, it's um challenging. This leadership, and one of the other things that I noticed is on some level, Miriam has legitimacy behind the question because when you read Micah 6, I believe it's Micah 6, yeah. 18. Yeah, she's, placed on, the, is, she's six, placed on the same four. level. Exactly. She's In placed. Micah 6, 4, it says, the Lord sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And Miriam on the same level. Yes. So there's a leadership triad. And now here this one is emerging as the senior leader, like what we used to call online, the shining ivy. Everybody's online. Everybody's pledging together. But you got the shining ivy who's always showing out. And, and then God affirms that this is the chosen one. What that also makes me wonder then is how we handle when we have multiple people with multiple gifts, how do we handle the person who stands out? Or the person who seems to have more advanced um, gifts or more developed leadership and anointing. How do we as co-leaders and others in the body handle responsibly what we're seeing as emerging leadership? Yeah. Y'all talk to me about that. Well, how do you handle it when you see someone whose gifts are more advanced than your gifts? What's the responsible way to handle that? You nurture it and give space for it. For me, I think I give respect. It's just, for me, I look at, I can use you as an example. You're like our big sister. You have, you studied to show yourself approved. You've, you know, when you come on here and you do a, put a lot of these, uh, you know, the PowerPoints and everything together and the lesson plans. I mean, we've watched you over the years do this. And I don't... I'm not jealous, but I admire it and I support it. I think it's awesome. I learn from it. So that's how I look at the leadership. I look at you as a leader. Yeah, so, I think the same way. I mean, to your point, I think when we recognize 
folks gifts and their strengths, like I come to you for intercessory prayer, right? I know that that's your gift. So if there's something I want you to pray for, I shared with you some issues that I was having on my job. And for the last four and a half months, <laughs> you've been sending me prayers every day, right? Because we lean into people's gifts when we recognize their anointings. But that's yes. what responsible leadership and discipleship does. Sometimes I think... um Sometimes I think we can fall into our flesh and our fleshly behavior, but when the, the environment is healthy, we can be corrected and get back on track. Yeah. yeah. I think That's the text, cool. I think the text helps us a little bit. Um, the, you know, the redactor makes this point about how humble, you know, Moses was and yeah. he doesn't respond. You know, he doesn't say anything. You don't hear him say anything. Right. Yeah. The only time you hear him speak is when he prays for his sister. Yeah, I think the other wisdom here is that, I mean, to your point, Moses doesn't say anything because a wise leader knows that sometimes you got to let the people work some stuff out on their own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to give God the space to do what God is going to do. We don't always have to intervene, right? Yeah. Sometimes we can trust God to bring to bring resolution to whatever the issue might be. And also, I, I like the fact that Aaron interceded for Miriam because he too recognized, wait a minute, that's not right. Both of us were talking, but she's the one who's catching the punishment. Right. I mean, you see him in his priestly role, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You see him in his priestly role. Um, Say more about that. What what did tell did uh, elaborate for well, the people what it means to see him as a priestly role? You see him in his priestly role because he's if you if you're saying that Moses is standing in the place of God, then he's going he's he's standing in between God and the people. He's going be going to the people, going to God on behalf of the people. So Mo, Aaron is going on be going to Moses or going to God, this figure of God in in this in this um you know narrative here. He's going to God on behalf of his sister for healing and restoration, yeah. right? And that's in his priestly role. So you see him, you kind of see him in his role. He also shows compassion for the people, if uh, that's the case, too. Yeah, yeah. And so. Yep. So the, the final note I had here um, was that it was important. And I think when I, I I think I preached about this text when I preached about the Joshua passage, too. And, and the thing that I think is most important is that the people could not move until Miriam was fully restored back to the body. So fully restored back to the congregation because her leadership was just that important. So she was a part of this community and being out in front of this community. So the community could not move on ahead without Miriam and Miriam's leadership. So I think that, you know, this is a good place for us to end. Not only do we have this example of a woman who's co-leading with her brothers, but we also have this example of the fact that her leadership was vital enough that the people could not move until she was back in position. Hmm. Um, and I hope that that helps us to elevate our understanding of women and their role in the development of ancient Israel, this Afro-Asiatic people who would later become the body of Christ. Yeah, Ms. Knight, and it was very significant that they restore her, Yeah, that the community of believers restored her you know i, yeah. I, I, <laughs> you I uh, love people being outcast and cast out and sat down and not restored is that what you're gonna say well that well that yeah i mean that and, and this is not this is an example of how of of people being restored right um you know I, my mother was my mother i didn't mother my mother died when i was real young i always say that right but one of the things is um I was told about her is that she had the memory of an elephant. And I kind of adopt that from my mom. If somebody does something for me, I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't have a short memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember. And those people remembered mm. the contributions that Miriam had made in their lives. Yeah. And they were not going to move yeah. until she mm -hmm. was restored. Yeah. Yeah. Deacon Simmons, I'm glad you said that. And so here's how I want to, um, thank you, Lord. I, here's how I want to end this lesson on tonight and end this study for this month. Why don't we, 
as those listening and those on the panel, why don't you put in the chat the women who've made an imp imprint or a deposit in your life? Whether it was your natural life or your spiritual life, those women whose names you remember, why don't you put them in the chat right now? I know we can't we can't answer stuff in the chat. So Minister Angela, you could just share yours if you want to. <laughs> oh, I was gonna put it in our little chat, but okay. Um <laughs> there are a couple people that have imprinted on my life, and I guess my mom is one of them. Um, I've always known my mother to be a very strong woman. Um, she always made us, you know, she always made sure we went to church. Um, and that we had some form of, you know, God or, you know, we, in our lives that she didn't just let us run wild. Um, sometimes as a teenager, we didn't like it and we thought she was too strict. But today I understand why she did what she did. And so I definitely, most definitely respect that. But there are other people that have also been very instrumental in my life, especially like career wise. So someone as a career wise, one of my old bosses, um, her name was Diana Peltier. I always felt really, I always respected her because she was very sharp and she always had an open door policy and she was always willing to explain things to me. And she had me doing stuff that most executive assistants didn't do. Hmm. So I was handling a lot of stuff and I had a lot of leadership roles in my job that a lot of other EAs didn't get an opportunity to do. Yeah. So she trusted me uh, to do certain things. Um, and then in my spiritual role, as if I were to give a spiritual person, I have a friend of mine, um, who is also in ministry. She's a pastor. Her name is Alfreda Edelin. Mm -hmm. And she has always been really focused and, um, you know, she just always really spoke into my life. And um, she saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I really respect her opinion and I respect her, you know, as a ministry leader. Yeah, we served together through um her through Hadassah, so I that's where I got. She was over Hadassah, mm. and um we would do women's ministry trainings. You know, we would have a lot of conferences and stuff. So there, I learned how to speak. You know, as a conference, you know, as a conference leader. So those are some things that people opened up to me to yeah. allow me to grow. So. Yep. Well, thank you all for sharing and for calling their names um, in in our, um, you know, the Hebrews tells us that we have a great cloud of witnesses, right? We're surrounded by these ancestors and as Afro-Asiatic or African descended people, right? As, as descendants of African people, um, it's important that we call the names of our ancestors because we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So thank you for calling their names on tonight and sharing the women who have made um, an imprint on your spiritual and your natural lives. And may we also make an imprint on the lives of those around us. So thank you for journeying with us for these four weeks. Deacon Simmons, you can put up the giving and um, yeah, and we'll close off for the evening. If our bishop was here, of course, he always says that um, whatever you would, he would ask that whatever you would uh, spend on lunch today, that you would sow into the ministry for this uh, PPS. And we have three ways to give, of course, our cash app, dollar sign, greater SJC, PayPal, stjohn.net slash giving. And then, of course, we have Giveify. Thank you very much. I thought you were getting ready to do my um here. I'm giving my lunch money. Oh man, you forgot. I was I'm on phone, my phone right here. Here you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's what he will do too, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, give me one second and I'm gonna get it done real quick. Yeah. Um I see you, Maximus Meridius. <laughs> yep, yeah, so make sure you give. Um, as Deacon Simmons is uh prepping his phone to give his lunch money. Yep. 
Done. And make sure you log on and join us um, next week. I think the next two panels are going to be very exciting. Um, I Yeah, you want to join in those. You want to log in for those. And tell all the men in your life, all the boys in your life, have them join in the panel next week. Okay, I'm sorry, Deacon Simmons. Go for it. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just hitting all of these. A lot of women are saying that you you played a significant role uh, men's tonight. Okay. Uh, Crazy and, you, and you have. so She has. She's played a significant role in mine. I just didn't want to take up all the time. I thought that I was <laughs> going to speak. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. good. All right. Thank you. Uh, Minister Angela, close us out in prayer, please. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, first and foremost, to say thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to expand on these women who are in the Bible, who have been servants, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for this last four weeks, Lord God, how much we have learned and how much, how far we've come just in four weeks. So, Father, we thank you for your word on tonight. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the ministry of the gospel. Lord God, we thank you for the leaders who showed up and did not think it robbery, Lord God. Lord, we stand on your word on tonight, and we thank you, Lord God, that you are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. But if you said it, you'll make it so even to a thousand generations. So, God, we thank you and we stand on your word on tonight. We love you. We honor you and we give your name all honor, praise and glory. We thank you for the men and women who showed us we stand on, Lord God, and who have lifted us all up, you know, in different ways. But God, have your way. Continue to have your way in our lives, oh God, that we too might be someday uh, those who have planted seeds in others and that they will stand on our shoulders, Lord God. So thank you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray and say amen. 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 All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.